Welcome back to the When Sinners Say I Do video series. My name is Dave Harvey, and today we're going to be talking about the subject of sex. So the title of this session is When Sinners Say I Do Sex. And we're going to look specifically at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, so you can open up your Bibles there. I want you to know that we're going to be talking today about your physical relationship with your spouse. Whether you are sitting there and you have no children, or you're in the fog of small children, or you're approaching the issues of menopause, or even after that, my intent in this session is to be both careful and pastoral, and to deal with these issues from Scripture in a, in a relevant way. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote... It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have the authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, to truly comprehend this passage, we've got to return to some details concerning the Corinthian culture. In fact, we can glean some insight into that culture by observing where the fires in the church raged. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of the kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. In chapter 6, verse 13, it says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. He's saying all that because sex was a serious issue within this city and in this culture. Now, here's what's so cool about what's taking place here in this book, though. Because people were getting converted to Jesus Christ. And they're, be they're beginning to fill up the church, but their ideas about sex still were heavily shaped by the culture in which they lived. See, in Greek thought, the body was earthly, not spiritual. And so sex was of the body. Therefore, it wasn't something that was spiritual at all. It was just a bodily thing. So for a lot of the married people that were becoming converted, sex was somewhere between totally unspiritual and just bad. And celibacy actually represented the deeper life. And so this is a church that was in, a, in the grip of a kind of theology of sexlessness. And the effect was that sex abounded except among married people. Sex was great until people were becoming converted. And so Paul begins a kind of biblical reorientation where he says in verse 1 to the unmarried, it's good not to touch one another. And then in verse 2, he addresses the marriage and says... It's good to touch one another. So Paul's response here becomes a kind of radical manifesto for the Corinthian marriages. And here's what he's saying in a nutshell. He says that marriage is about one man and one woman. He says that things like polygamy and homosexuality and paid sex and friends with benefits, even divorce, all of those Corinthian misapplications of marriage and sexuality, what they do is they actually assault the one flesh principle that was laid out all the way back in Genesis 2. And the point that he continues to drive at is your body is not your own. Do not deprive one another. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. See, this section puts forth some of the most provocative themes on sexuality that have ever been composed. And so I want to look at this together, and we're going to break down this section into three different themes. Think about this as the Corinthian guide to great sex. And we're going to begin with the first theme of service. Scripture casts 
the physical relationship between a husband and a wife in the context of service and responsibility. Let's look again at verse 2 and verse 3. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. See, there's an emphasis there on serving. And the focus of that service seems to target two specific areas. First is service in temptation. See, in God's wisdom, in God's grace, He has built into this fallen world a protection against sexual temptation for a husband and a wife. It's called your spouse. God installed defense mechanism because He loves you. In other words, the physical intimacy that, that you enjoy with your spouse contributes to something. It contributes to the health and the protection of your relationship, and it most often happens without you even knowing it. You know, I remember hitting a pothole once in my car, and I just completely busted my tailpipe. And I was immediately made aware of the role and the protection of the tailpipe because the car started to fill up with all of this carbon monoxide. The thing is, I never think about how the tailpipe contributes to my smooth ride or delivers me safely from one place to the next. It's something that's always there that I'm never thinking about until it goes wrong, until it's not working the way it's supposed to. See, Paul introduces a whole new category for intimacy, in other words, for why we're supposed to enjoy one another, why we have sex to begin with. It's sex as protection. Sex is protection. In other words, protection is not just a byproduct of being able to enjoy a physical relationship with your spouse. It's one of the purposes, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In fact, in verse 5, Paul urges you to come together so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But here's the key. That protection only works if we are graciously offering it to each other and often availing ourselves of it from each other. So here we discover that depriving each other is more than just not having sex. It's leaving our spouse unprotected. So it's service in temptation. But there's a second specific area as well, and that's service in giving conjugal rights. Conjugal just means wedded rights or marital rights. Service in giving conjugal rights. Now let's look at verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Now, we've got to pay careful attention to where the responsibility is located in this text because the operative word there is giving. In other words, the entire sex system is set up to supply each other, not to demand from each other. Someone once asked me, does 1 Corinthians 7 teach the concept of sexual duty to a spouse? I said to them, oh, it's much more radical than that. Our body is literally, according to 1 Corinthians 7, literally deeded over to our spouse. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And the blessing and beauty of sexuality is bound up in this idea of how our bodies can bring pleasure to our spouses and how we pursue the pleasure of each other. And in doing that, we actually glorify God in our marriage and with our bodies. Because in marriage, our bodies are claimed by God for the pleasure and the service of our spouse. And that is symbolic of the intimacy portrayed in this idea of the two becoming one flesh. In other words, our body is dedicated to the pleasure of the one God has given to us in marriage. See, this is why the idea of, of masturbation, s solo sex, moves us 
in, in the complete wrong direction. Because sexuality in scripture is defined in reference to marriage and in reference to a man and a woman coming together. So when we decouple sex from marriage, whether it's adultery or pornography or masturbation, that, that's wrong because sex is always something that is to be experienced with another person in the context of marriage. And by the way, that idea of giving, that implies initiative. I mean, just listen to the language. Paul is not attempting to be lewd here or vulgar, but he's calling us to give our body to our spouse. In fact, in reference to verse three, David Pryor says, quote, partners deprive each other in marriage by failing to give especially to give what God wants us to give. God wants us, God wants you to give your body to your spouse. Now, let me ask you a question, P particularly if you're here and you're experiencing physical problems or there's been a kind of sexual distance between you and your spouse, or you're working through the adjustments that comes with aging. Here's the question. Is this our starting point, that we are to be serving one another, giving ourselves, giving our bodies to each other? That God doesn't want us to deprive each other, but to give to each other. It's interesting that the burden of this section is actually to address the absence of sex among the Corinthians, and only, and only sets specific parameters for where there should be an absence of sex in verse 5. Now, why is this so important? Well, it's important because it addresses the places of comfort or self-protection that often keep couples apart. The force of this text does not diminish one bit as we get older. I mean, the reality is desires may change, but our fundamental orientation should be the same on our honeymoon as it is after menopause. Our bodies may change, but our call to each other does not. Now, that can be hard for some people to understand. If you're sitting out there and just had your honeymoon, that might be really hard to comprehend because it's impossible to tear you two apart. But there are changes that come with aging, physical changes, mental changes, emotional changes that can make sex more difficult, that can make it more complicated. There can be less desire that we experience for one another sometimes. Words like hormones and libido take on a whole new meaning the older you get. And so applying these passages takes more faith and more determination. I had a conversation once with a Christian man in his 60s, and he was talking to me in a very honest, transparent, and intelligent manner. And I, I, at the end of the conversation, I, I just said to him, what would you like to say to younger people who are getting married or newly married? And he said, and this is a paraphrase, he, he just said, don't reduce cleaving down to just having sex. In other words, he's saying, make sure that, that your understanding of cleaving involves communication and intimacy and affection, because the day may come when sex moves more to the side. And what remains is what's been built in all these other areas and not just centered on the sexual life. So we have to always remember that marriage is more than sex. But as you are active in that area of your life, it needs to be with the idea of serving your spouse. That's point number one, service. Point number two is talk. Talk. See, sex is not supposed to be this unspoken secret within the marriage or the thing that we're just too uncomfortable to talk about with one another. See, Paul's a single guy, and he thinks it's vital that we discuss it. He's discussing it. In fact, verse 5 seems to envision a husband and a wife talking and agreeing to abstain for the purpose of prayer. But implied in that is this kind of conversational relationship they have where these things are being discussed. In fact, one great way to measure our cleaving with one another is the freedom with which we're able to discuss our sexual lives. See, 
Now, this is an important point. An essential design of our sexual lives is not simply to experience pleasure, but that we would bond together on the deepest level that two human beings could have. In fact, on the deepest level, this side of heaven. In fact, all the way back in Genesis, there's this interesting word choice regarding the man and the woman coming together. It begins in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, and Adam knew Eve. Knowing is, is more than just the act of sex. In fact, animals in Scripture are never described as knowing each other. Knowing means cleaving. And cleaving encompasses body, emotions, and soul. It's this, this comprehensive exchange that the husband and the wife enjoy. But it can start, oftentimes, with talk. With talk. Now, I know when guys hear talk, they think of, you know, just holding court, because that's what guys think about talking when they hear talking. They think they need to be talking. But the goal in what I'm saying is not simply self-expression. It's, it's mutual understanding with your spouse. I want to suggest to you that too many people experience sex with their clothes on. You know what I mean by that? I mean they reduce sex down to the physical without the emotional engagement. And so often the emotional engagement comes by talking with one another. So talking just, it helps us to take the long view of life, the long view of marriage, the long view of our relationship, where pregnancies and cycles and stress and aging is something that we are negotiating together. It's something that we're considering as we go, which then it, it, it helps us to define success for our physical lives. So rather than expecting that there's gonna be these constant earthquakes of orgasm that always spike higher and higher on the Richter scale, what we're actually measuring it by is whether, we are, whether we're cleaving, whether we're enjoying and experience, experiencing intimacy. So here's some practical encouragement. Let me give you some practical thoughts that I, I trust will be helpful to you in processing some of this. Here's goal number one. That's to talk often and openly about the giving of your conjugal rights to each other. Now that may seem like an unreachable goal, but I wanna encourage you, just maybe later on today or tomorrow or set up a date night together where you're just going to talk a little bit. Maybe you could just start with the question, one way our intimacy can be improved is, and just talk about that a little bit. Trust God and wade into the question together. Husbands, exercise some leadership. Care for your wives by exercising some leadership as you go to tackle that question. And keep in mind, this is not an opportunity to download all of the things that you don't like about your sex life. See it as an opportunity to identify a goal together and then pray together about that. Goal number two, don't fall for the silencers. You know, silencers are the popular reasons why we just never seem to get around to talking about those things. Like, it's embarrassing. Have you ever felt that way? It's, it's embarrassing. Well, yeah, but we need to move beyond the discomfort we can feel or the fear we can experience to take up a conversation that is actually initiated by Scripture. It's actually initiated by a single man talking to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Here's another one. Well, it's supposed to just happen. In the, you know, these conversations, they're supposed to just happen. Well, maybe. But then you have kids and school and demands and, 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 and we can become distracted. And so we need to be intentional. Here's one we talked about in a prior message. That idea of by now we should have been, and you can really end that in any number of ways. By now, we should have been enjoying ourselves more sexually. By now, we should be able to talk about this more wholeheartedly and regularly. But here's the thing, that, that's not the gospel speaking to you. That, that's the law speaking to you because one rarely thinks that way without feeling condemned. And the law just condemns us. And so I want you to hear grace coming to you through this passage and grace coming to you through this exercise because God's only raising these questions because he's for us and he wants to meet us in the context of our physical relationship. Goal number three, 
Make sure you are never in a position where you are merely talking to other people about your sexuality and not your spouse. Your spouse needs to be the first target of these conversations. Now that doesn't mean we don't ever involve other people. There are certainly times where it is appropriate to involve people we trust or our pastors. They can help us. They can give us counsel. But what God wants for us is to experience fruitful conversations first with our spouse. See, that's what it means to be known, to be known by your spouse and to be known in community. That's why God has given us to each other. Goal number four, encourage often. Encourage often. Your spouse needs to think they are God's gift to you. And they should think that because you are constantly telling them that. I once heard a preacher say, whatever you encourage, you get more of. Think about how that could apply to your sex life. Goal number five, don't have this conversation at the following times, during sex, right after sex, right before sex. Don't have it through texting. Don't have it when you're talking about the budget so that you're confining your conflict to just one thing and not two. Here's when you should have it. When you're alone, when you're alert, and when you're not having conflict. Last point, heart. See, as Paul is seeking to confront the Corinthian misperception, heart is very much, very much in view. Paul says in verse 2, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality. In other words, because of the heart's draw to sexual immorality. Same thing comes up in verse 5 when he, when he says, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you. See, Scripture bridges two important ideas, and that is our heart towards our spouse and our sex with our spouse. Why? Because good sex springs from hearts that are engaged with each other. And most often, it's heart issues that underlie sex problems. M many sex problems that, that married couples experience are not because of wrong technique or something like that. It's more often one of the trilemma between sloth, unbelief, or bitterness. Let's, let's talk about sloth for a minute. You or your spouse is too passive or unresponsive or too ready to settle for boredom or you just lack desire and don't do anything about it or one of you is doing all of the initiating. See, don't get caught in the trap of thinking that sloth is always just being lazy. Sometimes sloth is being busy at the wrong things. You can be a great provider, but you can be lazy towards romance. You can be busy at home and not, and not busy in bed. So sloth can often be one of the reasons why we're not experiencing the kind of, of sexual life that God has for us. And then there's unbelief. Unbelief. I can't enjoy this. Things will never change, which is another way to say, God's just not big enough. The past will always define me. God can't meet my expectations, or, or I can't be good at sex. I can't meet your needs. It's too painful, or it'll never be pleasurable, or maybe we aim it at you. You can't understand me. You can't meet my needs. You'll never change. You can't change, or maybe we aim it at God. God can't answer my prayers. God can't change my desires. What's done in the past damages me forever. I can't trust God. There's no power beyond me. See, sometimes sex problems are related to abuse that's been experienced in the past or, or promiscuity that took place when we were not Christians. And it needs to be answered by, by understanding and counsel, but also faith towards God. So sloth, unbelief, and then bitterness. See, unbelief says you can't. Bitterness says you won't. You won't do this. You won't ever understand my feelings. You didn't exercise self-control before our marriage. You won't after our marriage. If you can identify with any of those categories, please, 
please don't be condemned because there is good news for you. There is good news in the gospel, and it is as relevant for you today as it was before you were a believer responding to Jesus Christ, which I think is why Paul starts the Corinthians with the gospel in chapter 1 and then reminds them at the end of Corinthians of the gospel again in chapter 15 when he says the gospel is of first importance because the gospel is so powerful that it speaks to the most intimate problems that a couple can experience in their marriage. It announces that the God who created marriage and knows every hair on our head loves us with an everlasting love. And because of the cross, because God has declared us righteous through the cross, God is always moving toward us in our problems. He's moving toward you right now in the problems that are coming to your mind, the problems that manifest even in the most delicate areas of marriage. And the cross comes and it recenters our identity so that we are no longer defined by those things that took place in the past. Those things that we thought marked us and defined us and labeled us, those mistakes that we've made, those fears that we hold on to. And that gospel is so comprehensive that it speaks to our sexuality and actually changes for us what sex really means. In other words, sex doesn't mean what it once did. Stolen pleasures, selfish release, a misguided grab for pleasure, betrayal. No, it doesn't mean that anymore. See, through the gospel, God makes all things new. So sex, can actually become a place of protected intimacy for you and your spouse. You know, a while back, a friend recommended me a book that was titled 13 Things That Don't Make Sense. It's by Michael Brooks. And the author, Michael Brooks, wrote about 13 different things that just continue to baffle scientists today things where there is no logic, no reason, no scientific explanation for them. And chapter 10 of this book was titled Sex. And the premise of that chapter was that biology and evolution tell us far better ways to reproduce than sexual reproduction. And he goes on to say that it's actually asexual reproduction, where an organism just copies itself, that is a much more efficient way for a population to reproduce. In other words, in sexual reproduction, only half of our genes get passed on. It's, it's one of the most inefficient ways to reproduce. It's only half as effective as asexual reproduction. So he's asking the question, why would the natural order not weed this out? Why would the natural order not replace this? I brought a quote from the book where he said, almost every way a theorist looks at it, sexual reproduction is a disaster. It just can't be explained. See, science is making a similar mistake as the Corinthians. They're reducing sexuality down to biology. But the purpose for sex can't be found in biology, can't be found in evolution or in science or in culture. It must be found in God. See, good sex, biblically defined, has to exist for something outside of itself. It has to point to a greater reality beyond me, beyond my spouse, even beyond our marriage. God loves good sex. He wants you to enjoy good sex. He created sex that we might enjoy it, and he wants to help us protect it because it not only says much about marriage, but it says much about him.